started. What's up, everyone? Those of you that saw my title know that you also suffer from the same problem. I'm sure many people on here do. And it's the obsession of gear. You guys see that I have a lot of gear. As a matter of fact, I'm holding a new guitar right now that I got from PRS. Now, this guitar is a loner. I traded in the, uh, the hollow body guitar for this Custom 24, which is beautiful, right? But do I really need another guitar? Um, I was uh, at a music store this past weekend and I, I, I was talking with someone here at the studio. We were doing a session the other day and I've been looking for a white Les Paul custom for, well, since I was in high school and I, uh, or since I was a freshman in college and I gave my white Gibson Les Paul custom to my brother, John, who traded it for a Kramer with a, with a scalloped <laughs> fingerboard, which he still has. So I've been telling him, John, I'm going to get, eventually I'm going to get, find a white Les Paul custom. Now the Les Paul custom that is really that people want is a 1974 the randy rhodes one the edge plays that same one it was the first year that they came out with a white custom the only difference is that in 75 i think from 75 to 82 they started making the backs see this is mahogany here the backs and the necks out of maple the les pauls so it wasn't until the i think 83 or so that they returned to making the white les paul customs out of mahogany so the ones if you buy one from 75 to 82 it's got a maple back and neck and it's very heavy so i found this at a music store the other day and got it it's the only other guitar that i've really wanted now the thing with these white custom i don't usually talk about gear on here but i'm going to talk about gear today the thing about these white customs is this was white, but now because of the aging, it becomes cream colored after about, I don't know, 10 years or so starts becoming that. So you really want to, uh, you want to have an older one. Okay. Now this one, when I played it has, um, acoustically, I was talking about this last night on a live stream. And it has a certain chime to it, even with these chords like that. It it has a it has a uh, has a lot of volume, and that's that to me is the thing that uh, that you can tell from a guitar that's been aged well that it actually has a uh, acoustically has a loud sound. My SG that's back there, my '65 SG, is uh, is a very loud guitar acoustically. So. Anyway, so I'm doing this, uh, I, I, I found this guitar and then I went to a different store. I was telling this story last night actually on my other channel, which you guys don't know about. So um, uh, that I walk into this music store that I've been going to for years and, um, and the guy says, uh, hey, this guy has two, um, Marshall Plexis for you. And I said, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, there's two hand-wired Plexis here for you. I said, what, what do you mean? Well, this guy wants to give them to you or, or let, let you have them to keep for your studio. And I said, what? Do you, and he says, do you know this guy? I said, no, I don't know this guy. He said, well, when Rick Beato comes in, give him these two Marshall hand-wired Plexis. <laughs> these are, you know, really expensive guitar uh, amplifiers. And... He says, well, we wanted to check with you. This seemed kind of weird. And he goes, why does he want to give them to you? I said, I have no idea why he wants to give them to me. Um, and the other guy there, Jimmy, knows my channel. And he's like, well, Rick's got a million subscribers on his YouTube channel. And he probably want, wanted Rick to use them in his videos or something. I said, I've got too many amplifiers. I don't need 
I don't need uh, another Marshall Plex handwire Plex. I mean, look, look at this, right? This is this is uh, this is just this room, you know. So uh, you can see I've got a, I have I have a what is it a Princeton there, and I've got a, a Deluxe right under it. Um, so, anyways. I started saying to myself, okay, this is this is really getting ridiculous. How many guitars, how much gear do I need? My friend Keith, whose channel 5 Watt World has a great video, how many guitars do you need? And he and I always joke that I always tell him, I need a lot of them because I like to play a lot of different guitars. So this, but this particular guitar is the first one that I that or the oldest guitar that I own. I got this guitar in 1977 or so. I got it from my guitar teacher Glenn. And it's a early 70s guild acoustic guitar, uh, classical guitar, you know, so you can play if it were in tune. It's a very nice guitar. Um And it's, um, it's something that I've just held on to. I mean, I really have this guitar. I have my Gibson acoustic. But I mean, honestly, beyond that, anything else could be replaced. Um, you can do pretty much anything with, with any of these um, with any of these guitars. I mean, I, I, one, of, one of the reasons that this started where I started to acquire stuff was for being a music producer. And it really started with, um, it started because I, I came from being in a band and in my band, I had two Marshall stacks with 200 watt heads, a, a JCM 800, JCM 2000. And um, my 800 was a 1984. And then I had a couple Les Pauls. So um, the... Uh, so when I started producing bands, most of the bands, most producers at the time owned their own gear. And, and the, it was just common for people to play the producer's gear. And then that's how you could control how good of recordings you would get is that they would just use your drum sets. They'd use your bass amps. They'd use your basses, your guitars, your guitar amps. And I noticed that I was always hindered by the, the bands that would come in. By the way, 30% discount, anything in my store, RB57. I just had my half birthday. I'm 57 and a half. So that's where the 57 comes from. Uh, but 30% off anything. If you want to support my channel, that's how you can do it. So the uh, so I was doing a session one time and and my assistant GL was, 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 we were saying how, how bad the snare sound was at the b previous band that had been in the week before. And I said, man, that guy had the worst snare ever. So this next band comes in the next Monday, he gets up there, he hits a snare and I was like, this is terrible. This is worse than the one with the week before. So GL says to me, what are we going to do? I said, you know what? I'm going to go to guitar center. And I'm going to buy a snare. He said, what? I said, yeah, I gotta, I'm got i going to buy a snare. So I go to Guitar Center, and um, and I found a snare. I found a, a Ludwig snare, and I bought it and um, brought it back to the studio, tuned it up, and it sounded killer. And all of a sudden, we went from having a crappy snare, and, and the, the drum sound, if you're doing a rock project... If you're doing any kind of a project, hip hop, pop, doesn't matter. If your drum sound is not good and inventive and and big, uh, it's really hard to get a high fidelity recording. So much of it is dependent on that. So, so I bought the one snare drum, and then then it started. Uh, then I started hiring a a guy that I rented drums from. And, and that eventually the, the, so he would rent, I'd rent the drums, his name's John and John would, I'd rent the drums from him and he would come and tech them, meaning tune them up for the sessions. And 
we would use his drums. Well, after a while, be, I thought to myself, I should really buy my own drum set. So then I started buying, I bought a drum set. There's Rhett on here. Rhett has a problem too. Um, I'm speaking, I'm, I'm actually speaking up for all of us with this problem. So I bought a drum set. I bought, I started, I bought a bass amp. I bought a bass. I bought a second bass. Then I started to buy guitars. You, when I, when I built the studio, I see, I didn't own any pro audio gear, like microphones. I didn't need that. Everything was, was uh, in, instrument centric. And I always would tell people buy, uh, if you're a producer or you want the, to really make your recording sound better, you need to have good instruments. It's the one thing you can control. Forget about mic pre's, forget about microphones before any of that. If you have a great instrument, you can have a very weak signal chain and still get a good sound. Okay, you don't have to have an eight thousand dollar microphone or anything. This is this is really uh, really important. Spend your money on instruments first, then microphones, then mic pre's. But really, instruments is the most important thing. And a lot of the people that I looked up to the, the producers, guys like Brendan O'Brien that lived in town here. He had a massive gear collection at Southern Tracks where he worked. He had 350 guitars. And Brendan did, uh, you know, all the Pearl Jam records, Stone Temple Pilots, Rage Against the Machine, um, you know, all these huge records Brendan did. And the bands would come in and they would use his gear. They just did you know that that was an amps oh my god southern tracks he brendan had a hundred amps in there now i didn't have the money for, for anything like that but every time i'd save up some money some extra money i would buy something that i thought was important and here's where the things that i looked for in a guitar you should have one less paul this is you don't need to have any of these but but my this was my logic a Les Paul Custom, because it has a certain, you know, because of the way it's made. Um, a Les Paul Standard. A PAF guitar. A P90 guitar, like a Les Paul Jr. A Telecaster, because it has a different pickup configuration. A Stratocaster. Um, something maybe like a Jazzmaster that has a very radically different sound. Um, something with a whammy bar on it. You know, it could be something like the PRS here, the Custom 24. Um... Then you'd have, um, uh, I've got, uh, as far as basses back here, I have a Fender Precision bass, I have a Fender Jazz bass, I have a Rickenbacker, those are three common sounds, and I have an Ernie Ball. The Ernie Ball has, has um, uh, active pickups, so if you're doing metal, and it's also five string, and uh, so you won't, if you need to tune down, and constantly people would be coming in with all these different low tunings. This is before, you know, people were using seven strings and stuff too, which I did have one at the time. Uh, but, but I wanted to cover every particular sound that I needed. Um, same thing with drums, okay? So with drums, you have maple snares, you have steel snares, and you have brass snares. Those are three really common. And the two snare depths are six and a half and five okay so you'll typically have a six and a half by 14 and a five by 14 snare um and really you want to have one of each you want to have one maple of that like one maple five by 14 one steel five by 14 one brass five by 14 the brass could be regular brass like like a um uh you know, uh, it, I mean, you could have chrome over brass, which is what a Black Beauty is. Uh, you could have a real uh, um, uh, a bell brass snare drum, which is a lot more expensive. Uh, but but that would be a brass thing, and then a steel snare uh, of the same, and then then you'd have the same of a um, with a six and a half. Well, I would also have some exotic wood snares at the time. I had a Brady. Jura uh, snare that's a stave snare put together with with um, with about 10 pieces or so um, and these all had different sounds this is how I would uh, this is how I would plan my recordings where um, 
okay, what kind of drum sound are we gonna go for? What is the drum set gonna be? Am I gonna use a Gretsch kit? Am I gonna use a Ludwig kit? Am I gonna use a vintage kit with reinforcement hoops, right? Am I gonna use a Tama? Bobby says Tama Bell Brass, very incredibly expensive snare drum, but great sound. Nothing sounds like Bell Brass. And if you, um, if you spend the money in the instruments you that you don't have to spend as much money on microphones. I don't have super expensive microphones. There's people I know that have $6,000 tube mics and things like that. I don't have anything like that. Big, large diameter mics. I mean, I've got decent mics. I've got really nice mic pre's, but I spent my money on the actual guitars and amplifiers and drum kits. You know, um, the I have two uh, bass amps that are really essential. I have three. I have a B15 style amp. I have an SVT, and I have a dark glass that you see me play in a lot of videos, which makes is the best for modern bass sounding, for gent, for any new metal, any progressive metal. Dark glass makes the best bass stuff. They make great pl uh, uh, foot pedals like this. This is the Alpha Omega pedal here, but they, I, they make a lot of different pedals. Um, this is another one that they make here. I see I got them sitting right here. Um, so, so this is what I would spend my money on is this, um, uh, I would spend my money on, on really quality instruments. And that's, that is my recommendation for people is to, um, is to, is to put their money there because there's nothing that can change other than the than the player, nothing's going to change your sound better or quicker than having a really well maintained, great sounding instrument. Period. That's why, you know, when I'm playing this custom twenty four here, as soon as I took this out of the case, it just came today. The thing with PRSs is, is that they are unbelievably well set up. This guitar is absolutely spectacular right out of the case there is not a high fret there's nothing it sounds great it plays perfectly it's it's um you know as far as the quality control prs is is first rate um the guitar sounds great and this is gonna uh you know if i needed one guitar yeah, this could be it. My one guitar could be my my Les Paul. It could be my 335 back there. It could be any of those. But uh, um, that's the first place to spend your money. Um, I, I I was saying to, to Billy about how, okay, I'm not getting anything else after I get this. He knows I've been looking for this white guitar, right, Billy? Yeah. I, I told Billy, I've been looking for this white custom. Anybody that's followed my channel for the last three years knows I've been looking for a white uh, Les Paul custom. I bought one, a 74 on eBay, and it got here and the neck was broken. The headstock was broken off. Literally cracked completely through hanging there. I took it out of the thing and I shipped it right back to the guy. Um, so, um, so, so that's... You know, when I look at this stuff, I mean, how many amps am I going to play through? Well, I actually use, I bet you guys know this. Anybody that's watched this channel knows I've used pretty much every amp. Um, I've used pretty much every amplifier over there in a video in the last six months. I have. I literally have. Um I wouldn't say I've used every guitar, but I've used just about every guitar. Billy, have I used every guitar? Um, pretty close, yeah. Most, right? So some that are hidden that you haven't used. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've I've uh, I've used just about every single guitar here. Um, and but you guys know I play the Dan Electro a lot. I've used that many, many times. I have amps in my other, in this studio that's 30 feet away too, in the live room. I don't use that Jubilee enough. I know I don't. So, uh, somebody asked me if I would, if I wanted to sell that the other day. Hey, you want to sell your Jubilee stack? And I said, no. 
So, but th this is a real, uh, this is a real thing. This, this uh, gear acquisition syndrome, you know, how much is enough? It's, it's, uh, it's something that I talk about with all my musician friends. Um, you know, we talk about this constantly. And um, the nice thing about this channel is that I can actually make videos based around um, based around gear because uh, um, because I can. You know, I, I just, I'm trying to think. I just did that video with Dave where, where what, we did the uh, heavy guitar amps video? Yes. That was what, about two weeks ago, a week ago? About a week ago. Yeah, about a week ago, I did a video with Dave Honorado and he came in and we used the, um, it was a high gain amp shootout, basically. We used the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier. We used the, um, the orange Rocker Verb 100. We used the... Uh, Oh, we used the PV6505 and we used the EVH. And we, we tried to, to use the, um, the um, JSAM 2000, but it blew the, uh, the tubes blue. As a matter of fact, I got to get that fixed. Um, so, uh, so just in one video, we used all those, right? So, um, uh, so, so that's, you know, I, I'm trying to do these things, but I have been going through and I have been getting rid of stuff. I've been selling stuff. Uh, I, I've been selling some mic pre's that I never use anymore. I sold uh, six mic pre's last week. No, no. Yeah, six mic pre's. I'm having some stuff repaired. Um, you really need to do maintenance on gear, not just guitars and amplifiers, but you need to do maintenance on studio recording gear like mic pre's and stuff. I have a, a series of, uh, of Burl mic pre's that I've had for 15 years that all need to be serviced. Two of them, the Phantom Power does not work. Another one, the 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 um, attenuator on it is uh, incredibly scratchy. It needs to be gone over by the company. So I have it packed up, ready to be sent back. Um, and, you know, I see people saying in here, oh, the Kemper helped with your gear acquisition syndrome tremendously. Um, I don't have a Kemper. I have an Axe FX3 that I'm checking out. Uh, but I have a couple other things that I'm going to be making videos on, like um, uh, my my Ox, which is a um, has a IR responses and uh, it's a um, reactive load. And I also have a Sur reactive load, and I also have a uh, Tone King attenuator that actually acts as a reactive load. If you have a cabinet simulator, which I do, um, you can use a cabinet simulator like this. This is a cab simulator. It's called a Cab Zeus. This has cabinets in it. For those of you that have tube amps uh, and want to use different cabinets, you can buy things like this. Uh, Billy, can you help me with this here with the, the serve? Yeah. You can get, because I, I think this is honestly the wave of the future here. Things like this and the ox. This is the Sur reactive load here and it has impulse responses. Uh, Pete, Pete Thorne told me about this. He also uses the ox. But what this does is you plug into it you plug your amplifier into the back of it and it puts a load on the amp so you don't need a speaker cabinet. And then you take the line out on it and it has, and you can go right into your DAW or you can go right into a small monitor speaker. And this is, uh, um, so you can use a tube amp and use your foot pedals, but you don't have to mic a cab and you don't have to play on 100 dB, you know? So... You know, attenuators and reactive loads and things like that are really, um, are, I, th I think that this is really a wave of the future is these things like the ox. Um, you know, a lot of people have gone to the Helix and gone to the Kemper and the Axe FX um, for convenience, but I think people that, um, uh, people that want to mic guitar cabinets or have the sound of a mic cabinet and want to play through their tube amp, which has a certain reaction 
the, the, it reacts a certain way. I think that the way to do it that some people might be happy with is using something like the SIR, the reactive load there, or using the OX. Um, so I have amp, I have cabinets that I can mic up. I have the microphones and I can play incredibly loud because I have a recording studio here. So anyways, so the, these are things to think about. Uh, I know a lot of people are transitioning. They've spent money on guitar amps and things and foot pedals. And then they're thinking, well, man, I, I really can't play loud at my place. I can't mic things up because I don't have a, uh, I don't have a mic pre, you know, or I want to get a, a universal audio and use those mic mic pre's and things things like that. Anyways, virtual amps. I mean, there's just so much different stuff to go to, but it, but you can really just take what you have and figure out what's the easiest way to get you into the uh, DAW. And a lot of times it's taking what you have now and uh, plugging it into something like that, like a reactive load, the Sur or the Ox or the, um, the Tone King Iron Man that I have, which is an attenuator, but it will do the same thing as a, uh, it's not really a reactive load, but you can turn it down and use a cab, uh, use a cab simulator with it. Uh, anyways, but I, I don't have to do that because I own these tube amps, but I think it's a great solution for people. Um, how much am, am I affected by choice paralysis, Jacob says? Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, uh, I could probably uh, cut back on the high gain amps that I have. I mean, I have a 6505. I have a an EVH, and if you guys watch my video, you'll notice these amps actually sound radically different, except when you start tuning down. Then they lose their different. I think that they become less. The differences become less obvious as you're uh, as you are the lower you tune the instrument. And I had this really interesting. Th thank you, Jay Frock, Frockon, Frockon, Frockon. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I had this interesting conversation with Dave Friedman from Friedman Amps when I was on their tone uh, t uh, tone talk. Is that what it's called? Their 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 thing t talk tone t tone talk. Well, uh, but he was saying that um, uh, that uh, lower gauge strings, uh, lighter gauge strings, give you better tone through the amplifier because tone talk. Thank you, Joe, because they don't have as much bottom end. Uh, when you tune down, if you will, uh, if you're playing really heavy low tuned metal, you want to put a high pass filter in front of the amplifier because the amplifier um, does not react well to amp to to guitars that, have a, that are basically like basses. So um, I would typically go through a distortion pedal first, which would high pass the guitar with just a little bit of distortion on it, change the tone, and it, it would tighten the t sound up tremendously or an EQ pedal before I went into the amp. Um, Misha from Periphery has a pedal, the Horizon device, uh, what's it called? The Precision, um, Precision Drive. And on it, he has a high pass filter. Friedman has a pedal out there with uh, that has a high pass filter on it, and this is why because you want to high pass um, the guitar if it's really low tuned before it goes in the amplifier. You will notice that it will will be way way tighter. So um, anyway, so that's that's a uh, uh, that's something to to think about when you're uh, when you're getting sounds and when you're playing as far as. Uh, yeah, high pass equals low cut. Snap off just said that. Yes, that's right. Um, so I'm I'm working on some new videos. Um, I have a video I've been working on for the last seven days. I'm not done with it. Somebody says show this guitar. Here it is again. Just came. Just got here. It's beautiful. I like painted guitars. I don't like wood grain guitars. I don't know why. I just don't. I, I never did. Most of my guitars are uh, paint. Um, um, Billy, are pretty much all my guitars painted? Oh, 
Um, All except for the 335, just about. And the acoustics. And the acoustics. Well, oh, yeah. not, obviously not the acoustics. Um, anyway, so I know a lot about gear. I... I you know, it was a big part of my time as a producer. I produced all different kinds of music. I did a lot of music that was synthesizer based, uh, that would use drum loops, things like that. I know I have I have Logic, I have Pro Tools, I have Ableton, I've got all these programs, Cubase. Um, I have a lot of different plugins because I've I've had to become familiar with them just because people would bring in projects and they'd be using, oh, I've got, yeah, I only have my stuff in on Ableton, okay? So we'd have to have Ableton to dump the things off. And well, I, I had Ableton in 2001 and I used to use it for, to, uh, for drum loops. It was just very common to use it back then. That's one of the first things. Um, what is the metallic finish on this? I forget what this is called. Does it say, Billy, what the finish on this well, is? Like amethyst blue, but the, the sparkle's not showing up in the stream. Yeah. It does have a sparkle on it. Yeah, it does have a sparkle. I, that's what I like about it. I like I like sparkle kits. You guys notice I have in my drum videos. You'll notice that I have um, that I have uh, a lot of sparkle kits. I I just like sparkle. What kind of Fender amp is behind me? That amp is a uh, is it a Princeton Billy? Um, there's a Princeton. There's two Fender amps actually. There's a Fender under it. There's a Fender Deluxe on the bottom that was modded by uh, Peter Stroud, and it has six L6s in it. Uh, so it's got a lot of, uh, it, it's got incredible headroom. It's a great amp. I've had it for years. It was probably, it's been, it, it's, it's black, it's a silver face, but he made it into a, into a black face and he put six L6s in it. it. has a tremendous amount of headroom and it's a killer sounding amplifier. And on top is a new, newer Fender, Fender Princeton that I use for some of the videos here because it's a low wattage amp and it's good with pedals. A lot of times in the videos here, it's easier just to use an amp in the room and use the microphone here and have a quiet amp and use pedals to, uh, uh, to, to get distortion and things like that um, than it is to bring one of these other amps. It just, you just can't, unless you use an attenuator, you can't get them down low enough, you know, without blowing away the microphone and being too loud for me. Um, Diego says, what's my advice for a high school Green Day cover band? Um, get the Dookie record and learn all the songs on it? I'm not sure. Um, uh, how often do I restring my guitars? Billy, how often do I restring my guitars? Um... <laughs> How often does Billy restring my guitars? I mean, not really too often. Not that often. My hands don't really sweat very much. Um, yeah, they don't sweat that much. So um, I change them not once a year, more than once a year. I change them when they start to get a thuddy sound, except for when I am uh, using my Dan Electro, and I never change the strings on that because. Uh, I want them to be really dead. Um, what's the temperature in the studio? About 78 degrees. Does this have low action? Not that bad. These are nines on here though. Um, anyhow, so this is uh, so, so this is this is what um, this is some of the things I've been thinking about. I, I'm I'm thinking about downsizing some of the stuff. Billy has been and and GL have been in the um, have been in the control room and we we actually got a, got rid of a bunch of stuff over the past couple of weeks, just things that we don't we that we never use. I'm getting rid of them. It's um, uh, you know it's it's time to do that. I think it's a really I think it's important to do that. If you're not if you haven't used something in um, if you haven't used something in a year then I think it's, for me, that's about, um, that, that's probably about the most, uh, I would say, for me, that, that's a long time for not using something and it probably needs to go, unless it's something I've owned for a long time. Somebody asked me earlier in the, in the, in the thing about my classical guitar and Christopher Parkening, and Christopher Parkening, who's one of the most famous guitarists of all time, played my guitar, my classical guitar. 
I taught his wife guitar when he met her and then he came and met me and he's, he's, uh, he was one of the most famous guitarists of all time. Classical guitar is one of the greatest ever. And he played on that. He played my classical guitar right there. Um, yeah, those of you, I see, keep seeing five watt world jump up here. My, my dear friend, Keith, Keith is actually going to be here next week and we're going to be on live, uh, hanging out, talking about all this stuff. So, uh, if you guys don't know five watt world, you should subscribe to it. It's a great channel. One of my favorite channels. I always am learning stuff from Keith. Uh, he does incredible videos on, uh, you know, ones that make you think and, and ones, uh, about, you know, gear things that I never knew about. Um, yeah, so Keith and I will be doing some videos. So he's going to be in town next week. Um, okay, so that's it. Remember, subscribe here. Subscribe to my Instagram. You guys aren't subscribing to my Instagram. It's very important. Rick Beato one. I'm trying to get up to, uh, you know, I'm trying to really... Uh, increase my Instagram here. Um, discount code. That's how I make a living is, uh, you know, uh, through my store, through selling the Beato book, through um, selling my mugs and t-shirts. So uh, RB57 is the discount code, 30% off anything in my store. Please support the channel. You guys are amazing. Um, if you guys have have gear acquisition syndrome. There's nothing that, uh, I don't think it's a bad thing. You just need to keep it, uh, just need to keep it under control. Always try to buy, buy something. If, to, if you're going to get something new, try to sell something. That's kind of my thing that I've been. I, so I don't really, I haven't really increased what I have over the last 10 years or so that much. Anyways, all right, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. And uh, uh, I have a new video coming out. Maybe not tomorrow, probably day after tomorrow. So keep an eye out for it. It's one of my best ones I've done, I think. So we'll see you guys. Take care. Bye.